Subway Everyday Value means many mouth-watering piled-high favorites are $5 footlongs, like the fresh-toasted tempting meatball marinara. And made-to-your-order BLT, the $5 footlong anthem rolls on only at Subway, where great everyday value lives. Subway, eat fresh. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound, like a rusty steak knife. Cutting through a well-aged state. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Welcome to the BS Report. Even though I have a 6,000-word playoff column that went up on ESPN.com right now, it still wasn't enough. I needed to talk more about the playoffs. So we're going to have Mark Stein on, our old friend, to talk about the Mavericks and some other things. Also, at about the 35-minute mark, we're going to bring on a new character in the BS Report, my friend Kevin Wilds, ESPN Zone. He's going to start a new segment that he calls Three Half-Baked Ideas. And then, at the very end of that, we're actually going to have some women's soccer talk. I swear to God it happened. I'm recording this after the fact. Yes, women's soccer talk on the BS Report. But first, we called Mark Stein, and here's how that went. It's Wednesday during what's turned into a really fascinating NBA playoffs. I just handed in a 6,000-word column that is running today, and honestly, I could have gone for another 6,000. I really could have. But I had to call our friend Mark Stein because I know he is just covered in dried champagne and, and Dirk Nowitzki man hugs at this point. Steiny Mo, are you alive? And they haven't even gotten back from San Antonio yet. Or well, they're back, but I haven't seen them yet. Give me a give me a minute to get over <laughs> to Dirk's house for the hug fest. <laughs> that was something. I really thought Dallas was going to win, but that it, to win that decisively and to just ram the stake into the heart of the Spurs was something to watch. You know, I just. I mean, I could, I can't believe, and it kills me to say this because I love Mason. I like his game, mm. and I love, you know, the guy is a, uh, he played in Israel. He's a big fan of Israel. He goes back on his own time, so I'm obligated to love this guy. But he just did nothing in this series. Nothing. I mean, all year, I mean, we were calling him Big Shot Raj during the regular season, and yeah. he needed to be their third wheel, and they had no third wheel. Well, when Joe House and I, NBA expert, noted expert Joe House. Yeah, who gets uh, more run than I ever will. <laughs> when we broke down the playoffs in our playoff preview, both of us expressed major concern that the Spurs were relying on Roger Mason to this degree. Not that he didn't have the talent, but you just don't know. You don't know until the until you actually see these guys in big games. And once he didn't show up, that was it. But I, you know, the bigger issue beyond the obvious main thing is that Duncan just is at a slightly different point in his career now. Well, that's true, but I think we're also rushing to bury him. I mean, on one leg, look at the last two games. 25-10-7 and seven in Game 4, 30-8 and eight in Game 5. Yeah, he missed a lot of free throws, but the guy is hardly finished. I, I'm with you. I, I mean, just think I mean, he's I, I, a little past his prime. A tiny I think, bit. I, th- I, think, uh, I think there's a couple things here. One... The Mavs, the Mavs were a horrible matchup for San Antonio because they have no, they really have no fear of the Spurs. Yep. They've played them so many times. These teams know each other inside out. The Mavs were going to be, except for the Lakers, the Mavs are the team that's least messed up by having to deal with San Antonio's experience and all their tricks and the, going to their place and all that stuff. But the other thing is, I think Parker and Duncan, deep down, even though they would never admit it and they're so prideful and all that stuff, it had to be hard for them to go into a, playoffs for the first time ever knowing they had no chance to win at all it's a great point i would also have thrown in that you know dallas won a game seven in san antonio once you do that you're not going to be afraid of a team but i mean they're the only team that's closed out a series in san antonio in the duncan popovich era so and won the game down by three with 25 seconds left and still won the game and you can't i mean i you know again denver is going to be favored in that series there's no question but the Mavs really have developed a bench here in the second yeah. half of the season. I mean, they, 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 when this season started, Jason Terry was their bench, and they actually have a bench now. Yeah. And I covered this a little today. I hate doing the thing where I talk on the podcast about something I wrote in a column. I always hated when people in Boston who did radio and have columns, they would 
regurgitate the same point twice. So I, I, I kind of have to in this case. But the fascinating thing to me about this Denver-Dallas series, which is going to happen because New Orleans is basically uh, DOA, um, Kmart against Dirk seems like a, like that kind of favors Denver the way – I, the way Kmart had played defensively against David West in that first series. But on the flip side, Phillips is a nice matchup for Kidd. Yep. That's, I mean, first of all, Kidd had a very underrated series in totally. the San Antonio series. Now, Parker went nuts. Kidd cannot guard him one-on-one anymore. But in game three, which was really the series that changed this thing, I mean, Kidd, who was not guarding Parker much at all, went to Carlisle and said, let me start on him. And it really was the help defense that was the difference, but you know they contained Parker reasonably well. The Mavs won that game in a rout. And let me just share this stat with you, with my which my man uh, Scooter Tomlin from the Mavs hit me with today. Kid played 186 minutes in that series, three turnovers. I mean, wow. he doesn't have the speed. Obviously, he doesn't get into the lane anymore. There's no question the Mavs miss those things. That's why we see Berea now. But I mean, he's making his open threes. And he's running that team really well. So let let you know. Let's, let's let's give him a little credit. Are you sitting down? I am. I actually wrote very positively about him for a couple of paragraphs in my column today, and said that the the Kid Harris trade, which I'm still morally against and think it was a bad trade, cannot na- can after what happened cannot be considered one of the worst trades of this decade anymore. I mean, he's he had an effect him, on this. He team. makes them smarter. I mean, he yeah. gives them. He's doing the things now that they thought he was going to do. Well, you know, it's undeniable that Dirk, Terry, and Howard, the three best guys in Dallas, are all playing better than they were two years ago. They have more confidence. They're more effective. Would you agree? Yeah. I mean, and I think that's a, the Dirk thing is a big reason why they made the deal. I mean, Dirk was just miserable. Quiet, you know, he's never going to publicly complain about it, but he was just quietly miserable. Yeah. You know, in the last days of Avery and, and bringing Kid in definitely rejuvenated him. Well, here's what I don't get. And maybe you can explain this to me because uh, you have so many best men at your weddings on this uh, on this Mavs team. In fact, if you got remarried, who would be the best man, Cuban, <laughs> Dirk or Nash? Or would you have three best men? Oh, man. Uh, That'd be tough. Somebody's feelings would get hurt. Yeah, I'd probably have to say... Probably Nash. the seven footer would, would probably edge that one. Wow. Okay. So you Nash have been so- tough enough to handle the disappointment. <laughs> well, Nash, Nash should be a great groomsman. Um, so, you know, I know you have inside info on this that you probably can't totally say, but we both heard the same things that Dallas, did, the players did not like Rick Carlisle for about two thirds of the season. They kind of actually sort of hated him and something shifted. And it seemed like the timing was right around the time when Cuban flew off that time in the locker room. And I don't know if maybe he was holding the players more accountable, just saying, hey, look, this is our situation. He's our coach. And you guys got to start acting like pros and come together. Or, you know, all of you are going to be out of here. Or whether Carlisle changed what he was doing. Like, what happened? Something happened. Well, it actually happened. I mean, one thing happened a lot earlier. Cuban actually went off on the team. That whole speech you heard after the Oklahoma City game when he said, everybody's out of here if uh, everyone's out of here if they don't start playing hard. He actually told the team that a lot earlier. He actually flew into Sacramento for a game. Okay. And they ended up blowing a double-digit lead and losing in the fourth quarter to a, what, 17-win Sacramento team. So the speech didn't exactly work that time. But shortly after that, Kidd really wanted more pick and rolls. He, 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 you know, he says, look, I know they go under on me on the pick and roll all the time, but I want, I want, that, I want that option. I want to be in more pick and rolls. I want to make more decisions. And Carlisle instituted that change. But, but the real change with this team, it's Josh Howard. I mean, he's... You've seen the the way he played in this series. I mean, yeah. You know, Duncan had great numbers, but who was the difference making Wake Forest guy in this series? It, it, it was it was Josh Howard. When he plays like this, the Mavs still are a factor in the West. I mean, title contention, obviously not, but I mean, you know, they're they're no closer to beating the Lakers than anybody else. But when Josh Howard plays like this, they're they're a dangerous team. You and need three. He, you need three really good guys. Now. I'm sorry. Um, you need three really good guys to compete in the playoffs. And I think that's been Portland's biggest problem in the Houston series is they're only getting two two good guys. I mean, the I third guy hasn't stepped up. 
I'm, Whereas Boston, I can't even watch them. I am so tired of the way they play. I know. I know. In All fact, this athleticism. I mean, they just—they're playing right into the Rockets' hands. I know. It's uh, you know, I I was gonna go on like a two thousand word attack on them, which I actually wrote, but I backed off. I might run it uh, tomorrow, but I've never been more disappointed in a non-Boston playoff team. It's just to see all the pieces there, to not see them utilized properly is really a frustrating experience if you like that. And on one hand, it's like, how can you bag on McMillan? I mean, the guy won right. 54 games with a 12-year, a team with an average age of 12. Right. But on the other hand, I mean, there, there are ways to beat Houston, and they're just not doing them. There's, there's a game plan that has been laid out over and over again over the last few years. Here's how you beat Houston. And they're just ignoring it. They're saying, we're going to do what, what we always did. We're just going to keep doing it. We're not changing anything. And, you know, here's another thing I, I'm stepping on in today's column. You got to hand it to Vinny Del Negro for playing John Salmons at Power Forward. It's kind of smart. I thought you jinxed that series with your last 6,000-word opus when uh, yeah. Game 3 was a route. But I guess how dare, I, how I, dare you question Notre Simbo? I guess you didn't. No, I knew. I, I mean, they, they're... The styles were just too perfect. And that's really, you know, that was a reason why the Golden State Dallas series was so great. Even though, the, you know, the, the, it ended in a blowout. But sometimes you just get these series where the matchup just works, you know. And I, I really think Dallas-Denver could be that way. I think that could be a, a, an awesome series. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, like you said, Billups, I mean, th- that's, a, that's a good matchup for kid. Th- that'll be good. Yeah. It's just going to be interesting to see the Nuggets are so physical and all those guys can all their bigs can move. Yeah. But Howard only played two of the four times when they played in the regular season, and he's he's just a different guy right now. I mean, he, his ankle and wrist are still messed up. But when he again when he's playing like this, Terry's having the best year of his career. Dirk is still Dirk. When he's playing like this, and Kid just has to be the fourth best guy. Yeah. You know and there. That, and I think it's proof that. You know, you just don't want to give away guys. You know, just because Josh Howard, it's not working out, you can't give him away. Just because Jason Terry, it turns out he's stunk in the 2007 playoffs, he's a little overpaid, you can't give him away. I think Milwaukee made a huge mistake with that Mo Williams trade. He's a good player. He's a good player in a bad team. It'll be the fourth place series, though, again. I mean, mean, obviously I'm biased. I live in Texas. Yeah. Dallas Spurs, you know, Mavs Spurs is a Super Bowl out here. But, that I mean... That series was ignored across the country, and if, if you know Lakers, Portland, or Lakers, Houston is bigger. The East <laughs> matchups are going to be bigger. Does anybody I, can I, even be paying attention to Mavs, Denver? I, I totally disagree. I think if you're a basketball fan, it's a fantastic series, and you have two of the the best scorers in the league, Carmelo and Dirk. You have some really fun bench guys. You have an awesome point guard battle. Two vets, just two cagey vets. And you have, uh, you know, I, Nene Dampier, I don't know. That might be a wash. Possibly. George, George could always implode. You got George. I, I think Carlisle's a better coach. I don't trust George. I mean, I, what do we know about this Nuggets team? New Orleans rolled over. I learned nothing. They made some threes and New Orleans quit. Like, what well, do we yeah, learn? that, I mean, that's the thing. Yeah, New Orleans is so broken that, I mean, that wasn't even a series. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's going to be the question. Can the Mavs get one of the first two, and let's see what Denver does to some, you know, how they respond to some adversity. Hey, remember in late November when I wrote that whole thing about how Chris Paul didn't like Byron Scott? I went to that game, and then everyone in New Orleans said it wasn't true. Where did he get that from? Got that from the stands. I think I was on to something in retrospect. I mean, they this this off season. I mean, I cannot wait to see what happens with them and Chris, Chris Paul. Now I saw Chris Paul about a month ago, and I, you know, I asked him. I said, "Surely this is not what you signed up for, trading Tyson." Yeah. And you know, he gave you know the PC answer and said, "Nope, my future's here. I don't think Tyson's leaving. We can hold this thing together." But I mean, what what a mess that is right now. Yeah, and I, and I don't know where they're it goes. all hurt. I mean, they're all yeah. hurt. Well, and Tyson Chandler, you know, I still think that that trade was ridiculous, but. Injured Tyson Chandler wouldn't actually have been as effective as Chris Wilcox and Joe Smith, as mediocre as those guys are. Tyson Chandler was useless. He was a dead body running up and down the floor. Yeah, um, I don't. I don't know. I mean, can they, I don't know if they can trade him now. Well, they they're can't. Going to try again, but I would argue that they have three untradeable guys. Buke's boy Presty 
I thought he made a big mistake not doing that trade, but it, it, I mean, it's, it's hard to argue with him right now. Yeah, well, maybe they knew. I mean, maybe when they... I, I, always... I, I still think, though, if they made that trade, they could have just shelved him for the rest of the year and said, you're taking the rest of the year off, get yourself right. We don't want to win now anyway because we want to finish high in the Blake Griffin sweepstakes. Yeah. So who knows what, you know, if, if Chandler takes the rest of the year off, where is he come October? Well, I got a little secret for you. They can still make the trade. They're at like forty million. If they want, if if they want to tell New Orleans, hey, give us Tyson Chandler. It's basically the same trade we yeah, made anyway. I mean, it might, and we'll it give might you a last number one, like a second round pick now. Yeah, seriously. Um, but maybe they knew something from that physical. But back to the Hornets point. So Page has got, you know, he's overpaid twice as much as he should make. He should be making six million dollars a year at this point. He's making twelve. Posey. I don't know what happened to him. Where was the guy who helped the Celtics win the championship last year? What happened I, to that guy? I was a miles. I was millions of miles off on that one. I mean, I thought. I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was the right move. I thought they needed somebody like that. Mm. But you know, I know. You know, Hollinger was you know all over that one from the start. Oh. You know, they should have split. You know, they should have got two cheaper guys and filled more roster spots. And they're not close enough to go for Posey and. Well, here's the thing. You can't go for Posey, but then let Gennaro Pargo go. Yeah. You gotta, you basically just exchange the two of them. You're no closer than you were. And, then... and they're, but they're front line. I mean, they just, I mean, they just didn't address any depth there. And, and West, I mean, you watch him. I mean, he just has none of the zip that he used to have. I mean, well, that's what happened to him? really, I, I mean, the backs obviously got to be hurting worse than they're letting on because, I mean, he's just, you know, mm. got no pop out there. And well, Chris, you know, Chris Paul's been playing hurt. Do you think that's – is that now a uh, most top five depressing franchise situation? I mean, the worst thing is, you know, all of us know it all. have been saying the fans will never be able to come back. The city can never support – I mean, the fans have completely overachieved and, yes, you know, been one of the best fan bases in the league, and this is what happened. Well, and then and then – they get to sit through a 58-point loss, which was maybe the greatest middle finger ever foisted at somebody's own fan base. How could you do that? That is ama- it is amazing. You do. You, I see it in Denver, but to do that in New Orleans after all the crap that's happened the last few years, to just inflict that stink bomb on your on your fan base like that. I, I seriously, if I had season tickets and I sat through that game, I, I'm not renewing. You guys can go screw up or fire your coach before game five. I don't even know how. I mean, how is it possible to lose by 58 under any circumstances? Hey, the, the way they rolled over and the way they just accepted it and nobody, like, clotheslined somebody or just such a lack of fight. I thought I was really disappointing. Um, and speaking of disappointing, I still don't know what happened to Utah. I mean, I guess we, we talked about this. You when, know what, though? You, they actually, I mean, I thought they were going to roll over. I mean, they they never gave up in that series. Yeah, but so, which guys you know, never that gave up? That, that doesn't mean a heck of a lot. But I mean, you know, I thought they, I thought the Lakers had to work a lot harder than I was expecting. Well, that, but I don't know whether they had to work harder or this Lakers team just has that fundamental flaw of they, for whatever reason, they build these leads and then they lose them. Yeah, I mean, it that, happens again and again and again and that's again. That's true too, but. I mean, I saw Utah late in the year, and I mean, you could just tell that that that, that thing was a mess. I mean, for them to, I, you know, on the list of unbelievable events that have happened this year, losing home games to Minnesota and Golden State down the stretch is yeah. still up there. Well, and it's such a shame because, granted, Phoenix without Amari wasn't going to do any major damage, but still, forty-six wins with all the crap that they went through this season. That was a playoff team, and to. To to see Utah fall behind by twenty every game, and then to see the Pistons just basically mail it in, and he, and literally mail tickets to the Cleveland fans, which they did. Um, I mean, do you know how hard it is for me not getting to go to Phoenix till October? I'm and, and talk, to, talk about talk about devastation. And I missed the playoffs without Nash. Nash should be in the playoffs. Shaq should be in the playoffs. Um, I I wrote this in the column. I'm just going to read the column at this point. Um, <laughs> but you know. I, I really do think it's not a terrible idea to revisit this whole playoff system. I always had the theory that go to a 78-game season, then you guarantee 14 seeds, 
seven, uh, six in each conference, 13 and 14, just go to best records. And then 15 and 16, go to a 16 team tournament of all the lottery teams. Anybody can get 15 or 16. And we go from there. What's wrong with that? Who would be against that tournament? Well, another thing, which I've, has kind of been a press row topic at some of the games I'm at, seven game first round is too much. When yeah, the but they're gamer not. was so much better. They'll never change that. Though. No, I mean they're not going to. They're not going to shorten the schedule. They're not going to change the the seven game deal because teams love getting that extra gate at home. But right. I am optimistic about the whole pick your pick your play at first round opponent deal. I, I do think there is some hope for that in the future. I love that one. I also think you know we we say the seven games is a big deal, but the reality is most of these series end in four or five. You know how many have gone to even six? We're just going to have three go to six. Or four. So half of them will go to six. Maybe one will go to a game seven. Yeah, by probably, my count. Probably your guys the way. Well, I mean, no. I mean, if Philly doesn't take this thing to game seven, I mean, Howard is not going to play, and they're not going to have Courtney Lee. I mean, that, you know, they can replace Courtney Lee, but if Philly doesn't doesn't beat Orlando without Dwight Howard. Yeah, that'd be pretty bad. That'd be embarrassing. Hey, there's been a lot of teams that are all at the same level and are complete non-threats, like Philly. Orlando, I, I would even throw in South, the Celtics and Bulls, as entertaining as that series have been. Yeah, but what about Reggie Miller says KG's coming back? Well, he seems to be the only one who... That, is, that would be so stupid. Why? Because what what is... Can they really win it this year? Can they win it with KG feeling his way through? I mean, you just you just wrote about how the guy's got three years and $60 million left. Why 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 make this year... Some be all end all just because they're the defending champs. I, I want to have Garnett the next three years more than now. I can't even have an opinion on it because we have so little information on what the injury is. I mean, yeah, see, now that's another thing where I, I got to take issue with you. I know that you think that, you know, we all suck and Bob Ryan would have sniffed this out 20 years ago or whatever. Just, <laughs> just, just remember one thing KG, especially when he's injured, is not exactly accessible. I mean, it's not like, yes. I mean, it's so easy for, I mean, the media is already afraid of him as it is. I mean, you don't, you, he only talks after games and at shoot arounds. I mean, so if he's injured to have, you, you get no access to KG and it's not that hard for a team to cover up medical stuff. I think the, the, what happened from February to April was inexcusable, but what's happening now is excusable because People who work for the team don't know what's wrong with him at this point. He's yeah, only communicating so sure to Danny. Some, I mean, I, you know, what? I know you are a veteran conspiracy theorist, but I mean, I, I'm not so sure that there's some conclusive diagnosis that they're just not telling us. Well, I, I, I will go to my grave thinking that he had surgery and they didn't tell anybody. And nobody's told me that, and I've, I don't have any inside information. I just think this whole but you're thing. You're you. Well, I just think it's weird, and I love conspiracies, and I think that. He probably didn't even tell the team and got some arthroscopic surgery or something. And because when he came, the key to me is this. He came back and he practiced and the knee swelled up and the knee was locking. And this is after he had taken two months off. Now you can't tell me he just took two months off and his knee was worse than it was in February. That makes no sense. So obviously he did, had some sort of procedure and it didn't work. Well, all I, I mean, nothing is going to convince me that him coming back is in any way, shape, or form a good idea. I mean, I... depends though. I mean, if he had like, let's say he had a sprained medial collateral ligament that he re-sprained when he was coming back or whatever, and he could play with a giant knee brace and be 50% as good as he normally is, that 50% of KG is still better than Mikey Moore. It's still better than uh, than having to bring in Scalabrini, and it's still better than having to play Big Baby at center and double overtime of a playoff game. But can they win it? All? You only bring him back if you think they can win it all. You see a scenario with KG at let's give him eighty percent that they can win it all. I mean, I I, I thought before the season the Cavs were going to win. I haven't seen one thing that would change my mind on that. But you just never know, especially. You know, look at the way they have a 3-2 lead right now. They're down by 10 in game four with four minutes left and somehow won that one. I don't know. I still don't know how they won game two. Um, so you just never know. And, you just, and especially the Cavs, they really only have one guy who's great. 
And if, if that guy has two off nights, you beat him on those First nights. Of all, I don't know. Yeah, he is. And what am I saying? They're not going to be Cleveland. Uh, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's just, nobody's going to be Cleveland. It's just not worth it. It's just not worth. I mean, I hear what you're saying. Mikey yeah. Moore has not exactly been the second coming of PJ Brown, but it ain't worth yeah. it. I mean, again, three years, sixty mil. They've got to deal with Rondo now, who's you know yeah. going to be expensive to get the money he deserves. I'll go this far. I think Rondo's a max player now. If Chris Paul's a max player and Darren Williams is a max player, then Rajon Rondo's a max player because what he's doing in this playoffs is better than anything either of those guys did. Well, I threw this out the other day to much much derision in my in my chat room, but uh, I mean, is Rondo the guy we should be talking about now as the as the next uh, as the Oscar threat? I mean, mm. I realize his his rebounds are probably up because all these you know Garnett. You mean Owen over there. LeBron? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think he he can fill those columns better than LeBron. Only I don't need know. ten points to get there. I I've been saying for a year that I thought. Maybe like a 17, 17, 10, 17 points, like 11 assists, eight and a half rebounds was in play for him. But after watching what he did in these playoffs, the, the only problem with the playoffs is he's playing out of his mind at maximum intensity the whole time. I, I don't, I don't think he could just casually put up triple doubles. That's the difference with LeBron. LeBron can show up and put up a 25. But 10, I 11. like his chances. I mean, he, he, I don't know. It just seems like. I, don't know, I like his chances of getting to ten rebounds better than LeBron for some reason. I mean, maybe I'm completely off my rocker, but I don't think we'll ever see that again. I just yeah, look, think... that, that's the thing. Nobody's yeah. ever doing it. Nobody's nobody in the modern game is going to. It was just too fluky. Double. You had a hundred. Each team took a hundred twenty shots per game, right. like, and was shooting thirty nine percent or something. So um, I don't think we'll see it. So give me a wild prediction for round two. I mean, I guess Dallas over Denver would be the closest thing. I mean, I, I don't think I, – I can't see the Lakers losing. Cleveland's obviously going to mop up whoever they've got. Uh, Boston or – well, I, I, I can't pick against Boston against Orlando, even though Orlando's healthier. Mm. I think Boston advances. Yeah. I, I, and I think I, we'll I, look back and we'll realize that the Chicago team – was even better than we realized when whatever happens with Boston next round. You know what I mean? Like they'll barely make it through this round, and the next round will be a lot easier. And then we'll look back and go, "Wow, how good was that Chicago team? Maybe that maybe they were really good." I mean, Orlando's a lot healthier, and Dwight has played really well. But I'm with you. I still, I I just I can't pick against Pierce and the way Rondo's playing, and I still think Boston finds a way to win that series. I I actually Orlando's stock has dropped for me. Oh, God, yeah. The game one performance was just abysmal. The game four, which they really should have lost, and it came down to Thaddeus Young forgetting that he did Turkle, who does the same thing every time in that situation and playing five feet off. I'm like an idiot. But, um, you know, and then they're, they'll Philly win game six. But win or lose, well, if they lose game seven, they're going to look back at that series and go, man, we really should have had that one. And Orlando, by contrast, I think is just going to feel lucky. He but looks ha- pretty hurt, though. I, I'm going to give him, a, you know, somewhat of a pass. I mean, he's just dropped off too far for for us not to acknowledge that the ankle is a factor. Yeah, and which which brings back the point of why is that guy playing five feet off him? Who is Hito? Is he is Hito driving past Th- Thaddeus Young in any conceivable situation with a bad ankle? Why aren't you just up on him? That drove me crazy. We've seen a lot of dumb things in this in this playoff round. That's really, but uh, it has been good, like you said, considering, entertaining. Considering we all think we know what the finals already is. Well, you could have some. Uh, we're, we're you know it's we're recording this on a Wednesday. You could have a game seven with Dwayne Wade. That's fun. You could have a Bulls Celtics game seven, which will really. Really rank up there if it compares to the quality of some of these other games we've seen. And I, you know what? I, I'm not willing to count Portland out yet. I feel like Houston's getting worse. Yeah, I mean they, you know, this game is everything to them. Yeah, Portland can put any doubt in their mind. Oh man, we will I'm, see how Chairman Yao handles that. I'm worried Door for Dork guy. Elvis. Yeah, my guy. I'm worried for Dork Elvis. Um, and then the other thing is he's just he's on Facebook. He didn't have time for the playoffs. <laughs> um, 
Wait, I had one more question for you. Oh, so we still think Cleveland, LA? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't see. I just don't see it. I don't. Dallas and Denver. I, I don't see either one of those teams beating the Lakers, and I. I don't see Houston or Portland doing it either. I mean, Houston could probably give them a tougher time than we give them credit because the whole Artest Battier thing. Mm. Just like we apply it to Roy, theoretically they can at least stay with Kobe a little bit or make Kobe work harder than he normally has to. But mm. Kobe also likes the sight of Ron Artest. That seems to get him going. So It really does. I think Dallas has a much better chance than anybody of these remaining teams wow. to beat L.A. I really do. I, the Nowitzki matchup is a weird matchup for L.A. No, man. They got, they got Odom. Really? Odom, that's, your, Odom, that's your answer? Lamar Odom? He bugs Dirk, I'm telling you. He's, really? He's, yeah, he's he's long and he can move. Okay, so let's play Dirk at center. Then what happens? Yeah, I mean, again, the difference now is Josh is playing at this level. And, he, and if he keeps doing it, that's another thing why everyone wants to say the Spurs are done. The Spurs defended, even in this decrepit state, they defended Terry and Dirk as well as anybody I've ever seen. Let's say I mean, for four games they took those guys out of it, but Josh Howard and Co. picked up the slack. So, you know, can Denver guard Dirk as well as San Antonio did? Can the Lakers? I mean, it, it remains to be seen. Here's what I'd do if I was Dallas: I'd play Kid, Berea, Terry, all at the same time. I think the Lakers they they have trouble when teams go small on them and and for whatever reason Utah wouldn't do it until they were down 20 and then they would come back yeah, but, but that is a tiny tiny team uh, but i'm saying so who's you your the, 4 and 5 three guards with Howard at the 4 and Dirk at the 5 you put Dirk against Gasol you've Howard guarding Odom and you've just basically run run on them and try to speed the game up and kind of mess them up so I, if I'm L.A., I don't want to see that. I want to see Eric Dampier out there, and I want to see Dirk being guarded by Odom, and I, I want to see all the things I can control. I don't want to see them mix it up on me. But it, for some reason, teams never do that. And that's why Vinny Del Negro, God bless him, one of the dumber coaches we've seen in the playoffs, the, the, the fact that he was able to change what was going on in this series by playing Salomons at the four, you know, the Celtics still haven't figured out what to do. So, America, we got that straight. Simmons picks Mavs to take Lakers to seven. Stein has no comment. I think it goes at least six. And I, and I think, I think that w- there's still a one in 100 chance that you're found passed out holding a champagne bottle with a dirt jersey on in about six weeks. I wouldn't rule it out. So you're picking the Mavs to be, beat Denver then, too. Man. I am picking the Mavs to beat Denver. You are just flooring me here. I think this is the year of Cuban. He's he's been able to solve every problem that we have in the world in his blog. I mean, he solved newspapers two days ago. Just solved it. I don't know if you read it, the April twenty sixth post. Was, With the easy pay thing. Yeah, he just solved it. I mean, it made so much sense. It was so logical that you just read it. And you're like, yeah, why wouldn't they do that? Like Cuban now is is like the wolf in Pulp Fiction. He just I goes always from wonder like crisis. how closely newspaper people really read those because I mean he does have over the years he's had yeah ten suggestions like that which are like. This guy really knows more about newspapers than anybody that I worked for. Well, I remember when Cuban got rich, everyone was like, and then, and then the internet kind of turned. Everybody was like, oh, there's the one guy that, that cashed in, and, you know, what a lucky bastard that guy is. And meanwhile, Cuban is just freaking sp- smart. He cashed in because he came up with streaming video before anybody else did, and he saw where it was going. And now he's just kind of... You know, he, he revolutionized how to be an NBA owner. I just think he's yeah. People done some hate him for things. the way he, you know, he acts on the bench and all the NBA controversies. But yeah, if you want to start knocking his business stuff, the guy's brilliant. I, I'm no business savant, but I think I think uh, I think you better take a look at his track record and 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 take note that the guy's basically made everything work that he's ever tried, pretty much. He's brilliant. Hey, the one thing he hasn't been able to solve is the officiating quagmire. Um, and he also does not have the balls to come on the BS report, which is sad. And really? I think we're, America is all, we're all losers because of it. Yeah. I can't believe that. He doesn't do podcasts. He doesn't like doing it. No, I'll talk to him. I'll get him to do it. I've asked him repeatedly and he keeps saying, no, no, I don't do podcasts. Well, he just doesn't like, like to it. have a phone in his hand. I know. Well, I, I even told him he could do it on the treadmill. In 10 years of covering him, I think I've had three phone conversations with him. Yeah. Well, maybe the solution is when, when he's playing the Lakers, 
I will invite him over to the Sports Guy Mansion. We'll just put a headset on him so it won't be like he's on the phone. And we'll do it in person. Do you have a treadmill? Do you have a stair step? I can move. We have a treadmill, and I'll move it into the office as we're doing the podcast. He can just do it with a headset on, and just we can look at each other. We're going to make this work because he's going to play the no, Lakers. There's no, there's no finer honor in the media than being one of the lap dogs camped under him to get sweated on while he's <laughs> stepping away. I thought you were going to say there's no finer honor than coming over to the sports guy mansion to do the podcast. I have only, only, seen only a it few. On, I've only seen it on the commercials on TV. I, yeah. you know, I don't think I've actually been formally invited. All right. Well, I'm rooting for Dallas, Los Angeles, partly because that means I get to have a meal with Mark Stein. That'll be fun. Yeah. Right? I will. Uh, I would. I would like to think that I will get to join in that uh, in those festivities. Oh, we got a Don Day out there. Nah, we'll 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 get rid of him. We'll send him to Hawaii or something. Um, I'll talk to you in a couple weeks. Good luck with the maps. All right, sounds good. Bye bye. All right, we're introducing a new segment right now. It's called Kevin Wilds Half Baked Ideas, and uh, Kevin Wilds works for ESPN. He's a friend of mine, and he is one of the people running the show for the new Sports Nation, which premieres, I think, in when is it? July. July six. We want people to start watching July 12th about. There's been a lot of clamoring in the ESPN offices to have Wilds come on, so we had to figure out a gimmick for him. So what we're going to do is it will either be three or five half-baked ideas that you have. We won't do four. It will only be odd numbers. So it will be three, five, seven, nine, whatever. Nine is a lot. Nine's a lot. Nine will be a long podcast. Um, (laughs) And also Jacoby set the bar really high with his uh, his breakdown of the duel. So, So good. So good. Yeah, I hope you don't choke. But um, mm. but first of all, why don't you why don't you quickly pimp Sports Nation? Get people. Oh, excited. Sports Nation is uh, airing July six from four to five on ESPN two. Hosted uh, by my nemesis Colin Coward. Your nemesis Colin Coward, and I don't know if her contract is signed, but a lovely woman. So I can't drop her name yet. Okay. So watch on July six, or watch about ten days later when we get all the kinks done. Oh, that yeah, you know, that's the thing is they always make a big deal about, hey, this show premieres, but really the show that premieres isn't the show you want people to see. You want them to watch it three months from now. Yes, exactly. Or three months from the premiere. But Yeah, don't watch all the first one. Like, ah. Real life doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Hmm. All right, give us half-baked idea number one. All right, half-baked idea number one is my Simmons book. Simmons <laughs> book of emails. Okay. And this is just such an easy idea. I read a Times article on uh, having a plan B once there's no economy. Mm-hmm. So why most people are going to go to, like, you know, selling apples or just marauding, I'm like, no, I'm going to print out all of Simmons' emails and make them into a book because the thing that most people don't realize is how do you, how do you like your Simmons? Most people <laughs> like the columns. Then all of a sudden the podcast. Right. And some videos. You can get your Simmons in a lot of ways. Yeah. The thing is, Simmons' emails, best type of Simmons. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's true. And then there's really no way to get that, you know, because it's an uncensored version of myself and also a more concise and I get to use F-bombs. Yes, and, it's your best writing. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Yeah. And you're a writer. Yeah. It's, so the I, idea that I have that you are a successful writer, is Mike, imagine you're a successful musician. Yeah. Imagine you are, mm, let's say you're 50 cents. Okay. And you say, yeah, I'm 50 Cent. I, I make a lot of, I own this gigantic house from all of my music. But little do you know, I do my best music just joking around with my friends. Yeah. And I, I have all of those tapes. Like, I have all my freestyles. Yeah, all your freestyles, with better beats, yeah. everything. So mm-hmm. I'm going to just one day show up and go to Gary Honing's office <laughs> and say, hey, Wilds, why are you here? And I'm like, oh, that's funny. I didn't even really know you knew my name. I was like, no, I do. Uh, I say, here's a book. He said, of what? We're not interested in you. I said, no, it's all of Simmons' emails. It's Surprise, 570 price. pages. Well, the it good just, news is in my book, some of those emails are actually in the book because you were on a list with a couple other people of things that would come up in my book, stupid topics that I was like, I came up with nine, but I bet if I email it to these guys, they'll be able to come up with like six more. And then that would turn into 25 and be a whole day emails. Like even those email strings, I think would be funny. Everything's great. It's I mean, it's great. If you yeah. should probably put out a mass email, cancel the column. You, are you really? You're trying to push me towards Twitter. I feel like. Uh yes. So, uh, here's the only reason why you why you shouldn't join Twitter. Yeah. A lot of times I'll put these uh, you know like brain droppings, George Carlin style, just yeah. onto Twitter, 
and you won't read them. So then I can tell them to you, and you're like, ha, ha, ha. I'm like, mm. oh, that's old stuff. Right. And I don't know. I, why, would you, why would you be against Twitter? I'm against Twitter because I don't really have any interest in what my friends are doing unless it's something interesting. I don't care that you're at Starbucks ordering a latte. I don't care that you're going to the gym. I don't care that you just rented um, – uh, what's that? Zach and Mary made a porno, whatever that movie is, and okay. you didn't really, right, you didn't really like my, it that much. All right. Let's pull up my Twitter account. Yeah, read me like five of your Twitters, and I want to see like if I would have cared about any of – although you're kind of a bad example because your, your Facebook status updates are funny. So, yeah. So, the Facebook status updates are all just censored stuff. Yeah. So that's where like my friends are – or not friends, you know, bosses and grown-ups. Right. Well, give me give me five Twitter updates that you've done. All right. Here we go. Um, Kevin Wilds profile. I mean, this um, is this all this John Salmon's talk makes me want sushi. <laughs> that was from last night. Okay. So it's, these are almost like one-liners. It's yeah. Like Night it's at like, the Apollo. They all salmon to the line. Salmon. So I'm like, you know what? I want some salmon. Right. Okay. There's one. Um, I like Drake the rapper mostly because I like Drake's the snack cakes. That's an inside Toronto hip hop joke. Um, there's a thin line between the best between the best drummer in the world and this random random subway bucket banger. Eh. <laughs> uh, Stephen Holden's what? To, oh, WTF Times review of obsessed exploitation because Stringer looks like O.J. Simpson and Ollie, Ali Larder looks like Nicole. That's just that's the one I used on you. You're like, wow, Kevin, that's interesting. Actually, wow. that was interesting. So this guy in the Times writes an article about that obsessed thing and actually blames the filmmakers for exploiting the Simpson Brown murders. Yes. From how old is that? Uh, 15 years. I'm going to say that's years. not in the zeitgeist at this point. No. And like the casting director is like, hmm, we got Idris Elba. Now we're looking for a Nicole. Here's the thing though. Your Twitter, I've now realized your Twitter entries are bad examples because you, I didn't hear anything like, Kevin Wilds is at the auto body shop. I hope my muffler isn't going to cost too well, much. Well, no, you have to try. Like, you would be good. Great name for an old rapper with a urinary disorder, Flomax. Yeah, that is pretty good. They, I, I, In fact, I'll go another. Here's another rapper name for you. How has there not been a rapper named Red Rum yet? <laughs> Red Rum? Red Rum, backwards. It's murder backwards. Mm, Red you got Rum. Red Man already. If you really, if you put Red in your name, you got Red Cafe, I guess. Red rum is murder. It's dangerous. You spell his name spelled backwards. He's gonna kill you. Yeah, it's so, Red rum. You know, a lot like of that. rappers aren't aren't into uh, aren't into what's the word spelled forwards and backwards. Um, then I into like a lot of reversing reversing words. Jack, there might have been someone named Red Rum during like um, like mid nineties like horrorcore rap, but it's just not. Jacqueline, you're smart. Jacqueline? Why, why, thank you. Are there any rappers? With, or What is the name when you spell a name backwards? What is that word called? There's some sort of specific word for it. What's the guy that I Dimitri Martin's got a book of it? Are you confusing it with, with like a palindrome? Palindromes, but it's not a palindrome. But right. I not a palindrome. It should be, so it's a backwards palindrome. Kind but of. a palindrome would be a great name. Palindrome, like just for a rapper? No. They're just much more, hip hop is just much more literal. Hey, I like murder. My name's Uncle Murder. It's like, oh, great. Guess what? I'm a fat and I'm a boy. I'm one of those fat boys. I always appreciated that 50 Cent didn't call himself 50 Cents. He actually well, yeah. just dropped the S. Because really, they, you can't just... you don't, Nobody gives you 50 Cent of change. You get 50 No, I think cents. he stole that name from like a Queens, Queens, old Queens gangster. He didn't right, come well, up with that. You didn't talk me into Twitter. Let's go to Half-Baked Idea number two. All right. Half big idea number two is about uh, Mike Gundy. Yep. Okay, so we're talking about for the show. We want to have like these little audio drops, like you have on radio. Mm -hmm. So, in radio is really good because you can be really quick with it. Like someone says something, you can be like playoffs, and the you know your producer's just hitting stuff really quick. So we want to do it on TV, but it's like presents some technical challenges. So we had to draw our list of our favorite audio drops, and one of them obviously is. Mike Gundy, come after me. I'm a man. I'm 40. Right. Um, so now if we had a producer, you would drop it. Come after me. Here we go. See? I'm a man. I'm 40. Right. So then uh, the idea, and then you said that you were turning 40. So I said, yeah. whoa, this is going to be a great idea. 
usually when you turn 40, you're going to be like, oh, Bill's over the hill. You're going to die soon. Your life expectancy is 80, and you're on the second half of life. And it's yeah. kind of sad, and we all make fun of you because you're old. and just It's just kind of a, a sad time for a man. Uh, but, well, I, don't, I don't feel that way, but go ahead. Well, you mean you should? No, no I, have, I have all my hair. That's as long as I point. have my hair, I'm happy. Your hair was so awesome this weekend. Oh, it was way. really. I've grown it out. It's, it's kind of like Bufante. Yeah, it was looked great. a little bit like CT, not to step on Jacoby's toes. Yeah, it looked I, a little bit like CT with the blowout. I even went no gel one day to just really push it over the top. Too much. Oh, go ahead. Too much. Um, all right. So Mike Gundy, I'm a man. I'm 40. Instead of these over the hill parties for men, you start. Uh, I'm a. I'm a man. I'm 40. Come after me. And you have these big Mike Gundy parties with orange and black. You have, uh, you know, streamers and paper plates and paper cups and banners. And, hey, it's your birthday. I'm a man. Come after me. I'm 40. You have your shirt. I'm a man. Come after me. And on the back, I'm 40. I'm 40. Come after me. So you were just became a man at 40. You're not yeah. over the hill. You're not in the back half of life. You just became a man. And it's a good thing. to have people come after you. It's a good thing when you're 40. It's a I great like it. thing. And you know what I like the most about the idea is that it will reach the point where eventually you have the shirt line with the logo, and it's just Gundy's face. Yeah. It's reached to the point where you just see Gundy's face, and you look at it, and you say, he's a man, he's 40. <laughs> I don't want to come after him just by looking at the little logo. It's like the no. polo logo for a Ralph Lauren shirt, but it's Mike Gundy's face. Yes. And think about, like, all right, you're a man, you're not 40. How many parties have you had with other men? Really, like, since you're, like, 50, you had a party when you're, like, a little kid, then you have, like, your 21st birthday party, and then you have your bachelor party. And that's pretty much it. Then you die, and everyone comes. You can call that a party if you want. Yeah. So I'm going to give you a midpoint of life, gigantic, pause, man party. Yeah. You with know, Mike Gundy. It, the, the real problem with turning 40 is that you can't celebrate it because... If you're like me, all of your, uh, uh, you know, most of your friends are from high school and college, so we're all turning 40. So it's not like, hey, hey, Bill turns 40. Like, yeah, Bish just turned 40 three weeks ago, and Stoner turned 40, you know, three months ago. And it's like you can't celebrate each thing. So what we decided is we're going to have like a, like almost like a, like how they have WrestleMania or the final mm-hmm. four. Mm-hmm. We're just going to have like a convention of all the guys who are about to turn 40, and we're going to go to Vegas, and we're going to gamble. And more T-shirts for me. Yeah, and we're going to wear Mike Gundy T-shirts. And if blackjack dealers want to come after us, we're men. We'll take <laughs> I'm ready. Just if you got, just wear orange and black. Just get it rolling. I mean, as long as you guys are buying paper cups and stuff, it's good with me. But what I realized is this is really, you know, all my friends are now married. So I have no more bachelor parties to go to. Because exactly. you get married and you have to convince your wife, I have to do this. All the other guys are going. So... Once the bachelor parties are out, then you have the 40th birthdays. It's like, oh, yeah, Bish turns 40. i got to be there. I've known the guy for 25 years. Mm -hmm. So you can play that card. Now, here's what I'm worried about. What happens when you hit, like, 42? Why? From my my financial standpoint, you can take it and have another 40. Like, I don't really care. I'm just about, about the bottom line. I'm saying when I hit, like, 42, I can't play that card with my wife anymore, the I've got to be there card. Dude, it's, you have it's his friends. night. Well, that's what I'm. I, that's where I was going with this. Is oh. I've I've been actively trying to make younger friends. Oh, and in, yeah. And in fact, I, I my friend Will in Boston and a couple of his friends they're only thirty, and I, I've recruited them. I, these are guys that are ten years younger than me who I enjoy hanging out with, and I'm positioning myself for their bachelor parties and for when they turn forty, so I get to relive that whole thing. And I'm just going to keep making friends with people as they get younger and younger and younger. That's not a bad idea. In fact, my best friend in 2028 is in eighth grade. <laughs> he doesn't like, even know who I am yet. You're like the Sonny Vaccaro of friendship. Yeah, if, if if I hung out with him right now, I'd get arrested. And people would wonder <laughs> if I was recruiting him for some sort of sex act or something. Scouting kids for pop culture references. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I got to you know, stay hip. I got to stay <laughs> hip with the eighth graders. What are you guys twittering? Um all right, let's go to half baked idea number three. I really right, enjoyed half baked idea number two. Half baked number uh, idea number two is probably the leader of the bunch. So half baked idea number three, I've got these. I've got four ideas on the board, but none of them. Some of them are more half baked than others. Some are like a third baked. Yeah. Either we can save Detroit, or 
I can start a monkey Hollywood business. What do you want to hear? <laughs> I'd like to hear both. Okay, so we'll, saving... we'll make it four this week. <laughs> so we we are against even numbers. So uh, saving Detroit is pretty simple. I recently moved to Bristol. Yeah. Uh, from Brooklyn to work on the show, and I needed a car, and I tried to buy an American car so badly. I just thought it was the the right thing to do, buy an American car. And I'm looking around at these like Chevy Cobalts and Ford Focuses, and just nothing. There's nothing exciting. There's nothing exciting. Um, and every car I sort of gravitated towards was from the 80s, from when I grew up, when there's like Pontiac Trans Ams and these awesome cars that you would say, talk to your car buddies, and you're like, wow, you can't get that car. It's gonna, you'll be at the side of the road. I'm like, but this is what I want to drive. This looks awesome. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now you have that data point. Right. Uh, I went through a similar problem buying sneakers when Jacoby and I did this sneaker show for ESPN. It's a shoes. Look it up. Um, that Nike was like, well, no one wants our, our you know, new-looking shoes. They want the old shoes. And some genius at Nike said, well, then just put the old shoes back into production. So now you can go to Foot Locker and buy a Jordan 1, a Jordan 2, or a Jordan 5. You can and in buy fact, shoes. Hold on. I have to mention. I, have to, I don't mean to interrupt your half-baked okay. idea. <laughs> but on La Brea in Los Angeles, between 1st and 2nd Street, they have like three straight retro stores, including one where the guy's a Boston fan. It's like the greatest guy ever, who gave me a free Celtic hat for my kid, which I really appreciate. Right. But they, this is a whole industry now. Yes, These retro. little secret, shoe, secret retro shoe stores. There's one on Melrose. There's three yeah. in La Brea. Yeah, so go ahead. So just retro everything. Retro everything is better. So why do you keep on trying to design new cars? Stop. Stop. Build me a Pontiac Trans Am that looks exactly like the 84 Pontiac Trans Am. But with better equipment. But with better equipment in an airbag, and it will work. Build me something from 1954. Build me a 1969 Chevy. I don't even, I don't know anything about cars. I'm just saying years and things. You know what ruined, here's what ruined your half-baked idea. And I'm not saying it's not redeemable, but. So I baked. When they did the Volks, the, they tried to remake the Volkswagen Punch Buggy Rabbits. Okay. And they, yes. and they did them, and they were really just ugly and weird looking, and nobody okay. liked them. Here's what jo- here's what Jordan did. So they had like a Jordan three. It came out in like eighty or five, five or eighty six. It was exactly like the Jordan three, exactly. Yeah. So if like I get into a time machine and get off in eighty five, like here's my Jordan three. How are you? Yeah. Kid in high school, like ah, oh, we have the same sneaker. Don't try to do anything different. All these people have jobs like, well, it's my job to design a little different. It was perfect. It was perfect. I I really like this idea for a couple reasons. One, people are always going to like what they remember growing up over what exists now. This is why vintage porn has become such a huge, (laughs) booming business. People are always going to be more excited to see the girls from the 70s than girls with tattoos now. Um, The other thing is, is, here's what really bugs me. What is the hot girl car now? When I was in college, it was the Jetta. If you saw a Jetta, there was going to be a hot girl driving it, and that was it. And if you saw a guy driving a Jetta, you want to beat him up. They might st- I don't even know. Is it still the Jetta? Well, listen. They should re-release the 1989 Jetta and just market it as the hot girl car. And by, the MILF. And, and the same thing in the late in the mid-late 70s, Charlie's Angels, Vegas, these shows, the girls were always driving that specific Mercedes-Benz convertible, mm-hmm. the 450. Two seater, top was always down, always a hot girl. I see that car now sometimes in California, and I, I just it takes me to some sort of fair faucet uh, flashback. How much would you pay for that car? Well, you can get them on eBay. They're like ten grand. I'm saying if if Mercedes remade those that exact car, two seater, yeah. put in like all their modern technology, had Sirius on it. There you go. I could get my navigation system. Mm-hmm. I think that car sells. Of course it does. I'm selling Nike has already done idea. this. Yeah. They've already done it. It saves Detroit. Well, maybe we could have a retro sports stadium, too. That would be cool. Retro yeah. Boston Garden. No luxury suites. We don't care. We're losing money. We'll work. All right. Um, well, those were three really good half-baked ideas. I think we should stop there. Yeah, the other one's not very good. Okay. No, that was a strong start. Jacqueline, what would you think? I I much enjoyed them. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, we're going to give Jacqueline, because Joe Mead is out this week, and Jacqueline was gracious gracious enough to produce the podcast. Um, 
Jacqueline, give us, we're going to give you two minutes. Make your case for why she, Kevin Wilds and his friends or whoever he wants to take should drive to Boston this weekend and see a women's soccer game. Okay. Well, the absolute, hands down, two best players in the world are going to play each other. Marta plays for Los Angeles. Marta, as you know, or may remember, uh, was part of the Brazil team that upset the U.S. team two years ago, 4 nothing. Okay, she you're going to be disappointed because I didn't know that. Well, you may recall the the news. She had a behind-the-back pass to herself. and no. then Nope. Well, nope. If you, if, Not ringing a bell. If you, you, if you YouTube Marta, that, okay. that, that will come up. So she plays for Los Angeles, and, and she's averaging a goal a game already. And Boston has a player from England named Kelly Smith, who is the second-best player in the world, probably, mm. who is also averaging a goal a game. And when she made her World Cup debut in that same World Cup, she scored two goals in, like, six minutes, and then each time she took off her cleat and kissed it in celebration. Hmm. So they are fun players to watch. Now and they've never, they've only ever played each other once before, ever. Can you give me the last names for the teams? Yeah, it's Los Angeles Soul. S-O-U-L? S-O-L, like son. Okay. And this is a name that goes back... Years for the team, but Boston Breakers. Oh, they stole the USFL name. I guess. I mean, when they had the old league, that was the name they picked, and Boston was one of the teams that did well, so they uh, they made sure to keep that name because people knew it. Okay. So Los Angeles Soul, Boston Breakers, what field will we be playing at? It's at Harvard Stadium. Nice stadium. I enjoy Harvard. Wilds, are, are we remotely talking into this yet? Well, well, I know Marta. Marta's the best. Marta's Marta is like best. female soccer LeBron. Right. Marta is the best. It's like it's like going to see LeBron and Kobe, Crosby and Ovechkin, Tiger and Phil. It's that level. It they're that good. And the reason you think women's this women's soccer league actually has a chance to make it is because unlike the men's soccer leagues that have been in this country, this is actually all the best women's players. Yeah, and and the league before was too, but this one is running a little bit better on a better economic model. Mm. The other one had the best players, but it it spent too much money, and then they couldn't they couldn't survive. Okay, here are my counters. Okay. One, people don't like paying for men's soccer. That's I think that hurts coming out of the gate because it, it's just nobody has ever established that professional soccer can work as a spectator sport in this country. No, and you're right. But the idea for this one to be successful is to hit between four and 6,000 people going. They're not expecting 20,000 people to go. It has a smaller goal. Hmm. <laughs> that, it wow, doesn't have a smaller goal, though. Women's soccer, everything is the exact same rules. Just wow, I got to say, that's kind of an interesting point there. What, have to have a smaller goal? No, to, to go for 4,000 to 6,000 fans versus trying to survive on 30. Where, where are they? It's a, it's a smaller stadium, though? They only are selling, you know, in, on one side of the field. Um, it's a bigger stadium, but they're not. Everybody's not spread out. Everybody's. Uh, yeah, if it feels like a sellout, you're excited to be there. But yeah, Jack and they're selling good tickets for for the Boston game on Saturday. Jacqueline, does it bug you that the women's sports that have worked and the the female athletes that have crossed over mainstream sex appeal has been a part of it? Well, I think that's a part of it for men's sports too. Interesting. Uh, more, uh, more attractive players in any sport do better. Really. Yeah, that's true. Like, Keto Turkoglu isn't getting McDonald's commercials. <laughs> so, you know, you can worry about it, but, you know, it's sort of the nature of, of anything that's an entertainment business. Are there women in this league that you would say um, young men would maybe find attractive? Are I'm there a sure. couple sex symbols? Like, I'm for sure instance, there are. If Brandy Chastain doesn't pull off the jersey, does that become an iconic game? Well, probably not. I mean, it's an iconic moment because of of what she did, but you know, it doesn't make it any less awesome. If women's beach volleyball, if they weren't playing in bikinis that were the size of like little acorns with strings in them and, the, and basically thongs, are there, is NBC showing that in, in prime time and during the afternoon? I would probably doubt it. Yeah. See, it seems like we don't want to admit it, 
But you have to find some sort of acceptable balance that doesn't offend women, but at the same time lures men to at least watch. And that's the secret. And, I, and a lot of people have failed or stumbled or whatever, but the, the pe- like women's tennis has found that balance and they've always had that balance. And it's just, it, it is what it is. And uh, beach volleyball kind of really strive to find that balance. But it, just like, but in women's tennis, even the best players are the best players and they're the people that people care about. Eventually, all that other stuff fades out, I think. Yeah. I actually like women's tennis more than men's tennis. Well, if I had and, my choice, I'd rather well, watch women. And and similarly, when you're watching, you know, you want to root for American players. The American women are the best in women's tennis overall, on the whole, mm. or they were. And that's uh, you know, that's another compelling reason why you'd you know why you'd watch women's tennis. Wilds, do you have a half baked idea of percolating just from this conversation? No, I, I'll tell you. If the WNBA had a, had someone like Marta, I'm watching Marta highlights on YouTube, the yeah. WNBA would be even more of a, of a success, we'll say. And that's really the, it's a good point because that is the failure of the WNBA is they kept pushing Lisa Leslie on everybody. Nobody really wanted to see her. Nobody was at the, she was kind of like too tall. It almost seemed like she had an advantage, but if they had like a six foot one, Jordan type, who was just totally amazing and slicing through lanes and making 25-footers. I think people would watch. They just haven't found that player yet. Maybe she's out there. I don't know. Well, and, and women's soccer, on the whole, to me, is the most competitive sport in on the international level. I mean, the two best players in this league, one's from Brazil, one's from England. And they're not super soccer powerhouses in the way the men's game is, but to have more players from outside of just the United States means that the U.S. players are going to be better and the tournaments and the World Cup is going to be better because the U.S. team plays better teams. Well, let me let me introduce you to my future because my daughter is a good athlete and loves running around and she turns four and we're going to have her start playing soccer. I promise not to be one of those dads, but I could totally see her dragging me to some Los Angeles soul game in a year. Well, here is your chance, though. You can go... You can go next weekend. The the Los Angeles Boston is a home and home, so they're oh. going to be out at the Home Depot Center on May tenth. I'm so almost. See, yeah, I think can, it's too early. I think I, well, this has been a lot to process well, in one podcast. I really my, now you have me going to games. Well, you're just going to <laughs> scout it. You're not going to get another chance to see Marta and Kelly Smith play each other. Hmm. I have to think about it. This has been a lot to handle for me. Well, I, I'm excited. Admit, this has been a pretty big step. Just this 10-minute conversation has been a big stride for me. No, and that you're even considering it, Bill. I'm, I'm very excited. Well, what I found is that the joy on my, fa- on my daughter's face, once I had successfully convinced her that Joakim Noah was a woman, <laughs> and she was dunking on members of the Clippers, he, she... The joy in her face watching a woman do that, I really would, you know, maybe that'll transfer to other sports. That is brilliant. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> All right, Kevin Wilds, thank you for joining us. Thanks, buddy. We'll ha- we'll come up with three more half baked ideas. Oh, I'll try. Okay, talk to you later. All right, that's it for the BS report, and uh, stay tuned for the BS report on Thursday, when I have maybe the guest I'm more excited about than any guest I've had is going to be on. I won't spoil the surprise. Until then. <laughs> Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. You laughed, you cried, you turned up the sound repeatedly, and now it's all over. This concludes another installment of the BS Report. And with all the talk about sports, Bill Simmons neglected to mention this important just-breaking news. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The $5 foot-long anthem rolls on with Subway Everyday Value. So many of your Subway favorites are $5 foot-longs, like that tastacular spicy Italian $5 foot-long and the piled ridiculously high BLT $5 foot-long, both made to your order on the freshly baked bread of your choice. 